I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Maserati Rick in Detroit Convertible bird in Miami Graduated summa cum laude Strip club made a tsunami Carlton Hines with the ball game Grateful Edmonds with the snowflakes Craig Pettis in the M-Town Sal Magluta with the boat game Falcone with the cocaine Like Freeway Ricky with the plug game Like Monster Cody in South Central Larry Davis from Close Range But I, I'm, a, I'm a original Miami boy I wanted the Miami boys really originally for me and I uh the Isaac King crew, Richard and Miami Boy. What was that, y'all? That was going out of town to Atlanta, or was that yeah, a fact? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, Orlando, Orlando, uh, uh, Atlanta, all over. Really, the Miami Boy. You know, we just started invading these cities because that, uh, uh, you know, back in the '80s, and you know, back that time, not by the '80s and shit like that. You know, uh, this was the uh, this was the drop off point. So you know, we was getting all the work. Dedicated, determined, dependable. This is Channel 5 Eyewitness News at 11. Good evening, I'm John Marler. I'm Brenda Wood. It appears certain tonight that come 1996, Olympic athletes of the world will be living in the shadow of one of the nation's oldest housing projects. With the deadline for a decision bearing down and tempers running high, people who live at Techwood and Clark Howell Homes have agreed to sell some property to Olympic organizers. Channel 5's Ken McLeod has the story. Amid shouting and finger pointing about most every problem that has ever plagued public housing projects, Atlanta Housing Authority Director Earl Phillips tried time and time again to focus the crowd on the subject at hand. Here is an opportunity for us as a team, as a family, as a community to finally together do something that's going to turn this neighborhood around. The Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games wants to buy this 4.6-acre sliver off the northeast side of Techwood Homes for about $4 million. Officials say that money would then be used to relocate the residents of these 112 units and to boost education and job training programs for all residents of Techwood Clark Howe Homes. Lisa Clerk would have to move, and she welcomes it. Yes, I want out of Techwood, because Techwood ain't nothing. It ain't nothing but a health hazard to us and to our children. This is the second vote on ACOG's proposal. It was approved by one tenants group last year. But when the legitimacy of that vote was challenged by other residents here, incoming Atlanta Housing Authority Director Earl Phillips decided another vote was in order. Faced with a June deadline, officials argued a yes vote would not only clear the way for ACOG to buy the land, but also trigger a domino effect of neighborhood improvements that would be around long after the Olympics. A no vote from tenants would stop it all cold. As people waited through the controlled chaos to vote, some opponents insisted the whole thing was just another empty promise. But most residents didn't seem to buy that. We are not going to continue to tolerate this dungeon that we have to live in. And the only way we're going to be able to do so is to have adequate cash. This first plan here is going to open the door for the rest of the community to get the things that we need and want and we deserve to have here in this place. Tonight, ACOG and the Atlanta Housing Authority have the answer they wanted. The final vote was 144 yes, 47 no, meaning tenants have agreed to sell the land for Olympic use. But it will be at least a year, we're told, before anyone will have to move out, John. Ken, the people in those 112 units, where do they go? Well, they're given a choice, and among those choices are relocating within a Clark House. Yo, yo, homes we back. It's your boy, Pop Alive. Housing elsewhere in the city. Mob ties. We on our way to Miami with it. But really, we gonna end up in Orlando. We going to Atlanta. We going to Tennessee. This is an everywhere story. So anybody from Miami, y'all get in the comment box. If y'all had any runners with the Miami boys, y'all get in the comment box. Now, this is kind of going to be a redo of a story that I did prior. It's one of the first stories that I did. If anybody been following the channel for a while. So I figured I'm going to go back and go more in depth with the look at this organization. Now, the ground roots or the beginning of the organization is going to start like right around 
the mid 80s 1985 so it's gonna be it's gonna almost coincide with the crack era um a lot of the articles or a lot of the um press that they would get was right around 85 mostly 86 and then it would continue on upwards to 1999 and that's going to be a very integral date as far as with the Miami boys because that's when one of the most influential Miami boys was captured um and we're going to talk a little bit later about him because the one thing I did notice about the Miami boys is it it's not a story of names because it was many of them um and the way I determined it was many of them because the stories they just pop up at so many states at the same time so if it was a group of organization uh organization or a group like we have today of six or ten members you usually can only be at one state at one time but just looking at it and this is stuff that i did not see even prior to or with the first initial episode i did the first episode i did was mainly based on um the miami boys going to atlanta um they did set up shop in a area that was known as techwood at that time anybody that's familiar with techwood y'all get in the comment box techwood is probably one of if not the most notorious um housing projects in atlanta and that's a lot to be said when you have bowen homes hollywood courts just so many different projects that go intertwined throughout Atlanta but that's going to be one that they said that they set up shop in uh, according to the FBI they're going to say an uh, investigation of large crack sales and distribution was initiated by the first judicial district task force um, in Johnson City during September of 1989 and Johnson City is going to be located in Tennessee um, and that was going to be predicated by an informant and the investigation identified a group known as the miami boys as the source of the crack cocaine and it was being sold in an area called the carver project so anybody from tennessee y'all know anything about the carver project i need in the comment box I man we need to hear about it now the carver projects is located in johnson city now they're going to say the method of operation was determined to be a weekly or weekly deliveries of kilo quantities of cocaine which was received by principal subjects and thereafter given to others within the projects who had various apartments that would cook the rock and turn it into crack for distribution so that was pretty much their mo everywhere so when you go back and you review the articles on them to be honest a lot of them is filled with violence um one i read went talking about how uh or i don't want to call it the invasion of atlanta but when they went to atlanta how you would the way you would recognize them is you would see them with miami hats you would see the miami tags you would see them wearing the miami shirts uh pretty much representing where they was from and with that they bought large quantities of drugs because if anybody that knows knows miami was almost like the central home base for cocaine at one time so when the crack era jumped off that was probably going to be one of the lowest place that places that you could have gone to get it that was in the united states so with that being said they were going out of town with large quantities of crack cocaine and not to mention that being that miami was so uh over flooded with the cocaine it drove down the price in the city of miami so the further almost i can guarantee you it worked like this almost the furthest you go away from miami the more you would get from that product for that product almost like how it works uh with the drugs coming into the country today so now yeah i read stories of how they would in broad daylight bring automatic weapons and we talking about 1986 so just imagine they we had they had military style guns in the music videos now don't get me wrong but in 1986 so you know they was out there with mac 10s and tech nines and all this shit and 
is yeah, I read stories where they unloaded on one dealer in Atlanta just to kind of send messages. So it was like they were semi going to these areas and taking over, but it's almost like you couldn't stop the takeover because they had high power weapons. They had more money because they had to work and they was in your town because the product that they were selling was selling for double and triple the amount that it was selling to back home and the competition was less scarce. So that was going on like from the early 80s and I noticed to the 90s, you'll see different articles with different names. I actually seen a person uh, by the name of James Sawyer wrote a book and he spoke about the original Miami boys. Now, if y'all heard the clip in the beginning, that was convertible birth speaking as far as the Miami boys and it it just sounds like a, a faction that branched off almost um kind of like something like the operation that the Chambers brothers was running it was the four brothers of the it was the four Chambers brothers but they were going back to their town in Arkansas and bringing people to Detroit to work for them almost by the hundreds to where it's like a corporation and I couldn't really find a hierarchy or structure on the Miami boys, um, Convertible Burt did speak on Isaac Hicks or the late great Isaac Hicks and say he was inf influential in the Miami boys organization. So we don't know if he was supplying them or what was going on, but I don't think he was out of town making those moves because he was making big money in Miami. So it's like, in that book, James Sawyer wrote, I'm sure he spoke about the original Miami boys that Convertible Burt spoke on. And I, I'm almost sure that's why when I asked him about it, he he definitely or he couldn't wait to say the original Miami boys because it's a lot of factions and it's a lot of, a lot of branches almost seems like. And like i said we just read something about johnson city tennessee so they were going to orlando they were going to tampa they were going to atlanta um pretty much anywhere else you can name i did read stories about them going into or not i don't want to say that they set up shop but had something to do with the crack operation being set up in savannah which has always been a hotbed or in, or one of the hot spots for the crack game coming up so they definitely was an organization to be reckoned with and and it went from like i said the mid 80s to you see um michael delancey who rick ross mentioned in the song turnpike ike right after he mentioned isaac hicks um was one of the last remaining miami boys on the run and he would end up being captured in 1999 um, and that's pretty much almost where the press clippings kind of slow up with them. But y'all feel free to search the net looking for them. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. Y'all hit that bell to subscribe and know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Y'all get in the comment box. Y'all hit me on Instagram, get into the uh, pictures, get in the direct message. However, y'all need to get at me. Let me know who we need to cover, what city we need to go to, what we need to do next. And you already know what it is. It's your boy Popular, and it's the mob. Mob, 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 ties.